to everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Kurs, and I'm giving a talk today about uh, porting AFIO uh, to the C++ 11 library to, uh, for boost peer review, um, pairing it, and eventually I'm going to talk about backporting it to older compilers. Um, so you know, I have a few desired outcomes from, uh, for the thing. Uh, I want to give you guys insight. This is, by the way, a novice level talk. Um, it's probably not most uh, accurately aimed at this group of, of people, but uh, I guess the C++ Now committee thought this would be good um, for others, uh, students, and people a little bit apprehensive about uh, working with Boost to hear. So uh, I'm going to give a little insight into preparing a library for Boost peer review. Uh, problems you're gonna have, you might see when you're backporting a C++ 11 library. And uh, I'd like to inspire young engineers to you know, contribute to Boost and hopefully inspire a lot of the people in this room and out there to uh, mentor students like me. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I used to be a civil engineer and now I'm a master's candidate at CSUN. Um, I used to be an uh, earthquake engineer for a couple of years, and the only thing I've really done with uh, computer science so far has been to uh, work on this library, uh, porting AFIO to, uh, to Boost. So we're going to talk about a large <laughs> array of things today, and just to give you an idea of what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about what the summer of code was like and all the activities that went on. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, preparing for peer review. Um, it's surprisingly less difficult than you think. Uh, it's not quite as scary as you might imagine. And uh, because it's going to deal uh, with a lot of AFIO code, we're going to briefly talk about what AFIO does and get a little bit more familiar with the syntax. And lastly, we're going to talk about porting, back porting to older compilers. Uh, we're going it's, to, it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's not straightforward and obvious what you do all the time. It's not an easy process. So I hope, I hope you guys will get something out of this. And we'll talk a little bit more about mentoring and open up for questions afterwards. <clears throat> so, Originally, excuse me, I don't know if that was the best idea. Um, uh, originally, we started uh, my GSOC. I got familiar with AFIO. I changed all the names to be compatible with the boost uh, guidelines, changed macros, moved external dependencies. There was a lot of overlap in these. These aren't like, you know, you, there's definite concurrency going on. Uh, we had to change the unit tests, uh, change the build system, reorganize the files and directories, uh, get the CI to work with uh, properly. And then we started backporting. And that's a lot of work. Uh, we ended up supporting uh, the last three revisions of each of those compilers. Uh, then we finished up increasing documentation and test coverage, and we opened up the we opened up our library to boost voting on what else the community thought we should add, and they gave us a surprising answer of directory monitoring, which neither Niall or I thought was going to happen. Uh, and I finished up just implementing a uh, prototype for asynchronous directory monitoring for the library. Uh, this is my slide not showing up because this is a PowerPoint on LibreOffice, apparently. And <laughs> you can find all the guidelines at the at boost.org. Um, that's the link. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping I'd get a chuckle or two. Um, it sounds really bad. It's scary. Like when I heard what I was going to do, I kind of freaked out. I won't lie. Uh, it's not so bad. It's maybe this is a little bit of hyperbole. Maybe it's not quite as cuddly as that puppy, but it certainly wasn't as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. Um, uh, it's in peer review or about to be.
<laughs> well, I did all this last summer. Yeah, I'm sorry. Definitely the. Sorry about that. Um, so the question was whether we AFI was already finished with peer review, and it's not. Um, we're in it. We're in the pile, I guess, to be reviewed. Um, but this is about my preparations over the last summer to get ready for that. Uh, it's Niles' brainchild. I'm. A, I was attached uh, to the project as a part of Google Summer of Code last year. So. Um, yeah. But it was still an of uh, originally, yeah, but I, it was always planned to be uh, a part of Boost, and I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. Um, so, this, like I said, this first part is really just about uh, preparing a generic, any kind of library, for uh, to be included into Boost to get it ready for peer review, and after that, we're going to talk about backporting to an older compiler, which is. <laughs> A bit more interesting. Um, the easy parts so far are converting names, uh, macros, and namespaces. Boost. Any any of us that have you know looked through the library know that there's no camel case. It's all underscores. These are easy things to do. They're tedious. They take a long time. They're easy to miss, um, but they're not specifically hard. And file organization and documentation are kind of the same boat. They're not hard. They take a long time, and you might have to tweak things to be exactly in line with the standard. But they're not specifically difficult. Um, so it kind of begs the question, what is hard? Um, making your library portable is not always easy. Uh, removing external dependencies is quite difficult at times. And converting the unit test to use boot test, not always clear. It's not specifically that hard, but we'll, I'll cover that in a more detail in a minute. And boost build has uh, got a fairly steep learning curve. So if you're not familiar with it, going to take a little uh, time to get used to. Um, basically, if you're removing it, uh, you shouldn't have uh, dependencies on other libraries if you're going to try to be in Boost. It should basically stand on its own. You should only be calling things like system libraries and other Boost libraries. It's kind of frowned upon. It, uh, I'm sure there's probably an exception somewhere to that that I'm not aware of, but I think that's a pretty good general guideline. It seemed very, yes. Yeah, I, that's kind of yes. You are correct that there is uh, there is definitely at least one exception to that, and part of my slide is missing. But that's okay. Um, so you can remove them entirely. That's kind of the best way if you can. If you can just get around not having it, that's great. You can rewrite it yourself, or you can uh, include the portions that you have permission to use um, in like a details folder or somewhere else. Uh, Boost test. Again, it's not that hard, but if you're not familiar with it, it, it can be a real pain. Um, learning any new uh, framework takes a lot of time, especially if you're a novice user, which this talk is sort of geared for. I'm sure most of the people in the room are like, well, it's very straightforward. But uh, for me, not having used it before, it was, uh, it was a lot of learning. And, and I went one slide too far. Um, there was a few things about boost test that were also difficult. The unit test framework we went from that we were using originally had a few different conventions. And figuring out how to make that work within the framework was a bit difficult. It wasn't that hard, but we had to write some uh, custom macros and, and extend the framework a bit to do it. Uh, boost build is kind of the same. Uh, it's just got a steep learning curve. And if you're a new user, uh, you're a student or you're a novice, it takes a long time to figure out. The syntax is clear, but it's not intuitive. Uh, and you don't always know what you're, like, what you're doing based on what else is in Boost, because everyone kind of does their own thing a little bit. There's not, like a, there's not like a strict set guideline for how your jam files look. There's not a, 
uh, strict, like, uh, there's no strict guideline for how you build your system, which is good, but if you're worried about passing peer review, it's nice to know what the current uh, standard is, so to speak, so that you can follow it. Uh, we're briefly going to look at a gem file. Uh, this is AFIO's gem file, and uh, you can see at the top, we list the project and the requirements. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff under requirements that if you've never read through one of these files, is really intimidating. This looks crazy, and it gets crazier. There's targets everywhere. There's, you're, you're making all these conditional uh, build requirements. And if you're familiar with reading, it's easy to see that, oh, I'm gonna, if I'm a linked shared library, then you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link with uh, boost thread. It's not, it's not that hard, but it takes a lot of time to learn. So moving on, uh, I'm going to briefly cover AFIO. Um, AFIO is a linear, <laughs> scalable, batch-chainable, asynchronous closure execution engine with an almost weight-free implementation extending Boost ASIO and Boost Thread, specialized as a portable asynchronous file I/O implementation library. Uh, that comes straight from my mentor. Uh, it's in the <laughs> AFIO documentation. And after hearing that, you're probably like, well, what does that mean? And in C++ terms, it's an unordered map of shared futures paired with a thread pool and using ASIO as the job dispatcher with Intel TSX memory transactions protecting the hash table and everything else running wait free. Uh, so hopefully that makes it a little bit clear. Basically, we're using ASIO as a central dispatcher and we're feeding it closures, which is how we're able to do file IO. We, are, we can send large batches of file IO operations in a closure to be done and we can set dependencies on it so that we're not trying to read a file that hasn't been created or opened or whatever. Uh, it lets us do a surprisingly good job of improving our throughput for file I.O. Uh, here's the most toy example I could possibly come up with. Uh, basically, on the traditional code, we have a, a small array of 10 numbers, and we write it, to a, we, we write it out to a file. Uh, we write out a, a file of those 10 numbers, and we're going to read it and do some operation on it and uh, read, the, uh, read the data back in, and that's it. Uh, on the other side, we see AFIO and what it's going to do. And it's, the top portion is completely boilerplate. They do the same thing. They just both create a binary file and close them. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom, ASIO, AFIO sets up a dispatcher. Um, that's our call to start it working, basically. Uh, we create a, it opens up ASIO and, and makes the dispatcher. And then we're going to start scheduling stuff on it. So in the traditional code, which is much shorter, um, we're just opening the file and we're reading from it and closing it. Uh, the AFIO way is slightly different. Uh, we're scheduling here that we're going to open the file for reading. Then we're going to set a, we're going to create a vector filled with uh, read ops. And we're going to create a lambda. Uh, on the next slide. Anyway, uh, so we set up the dispatcher to read all these, uh, all these ops, and then we set up a lambda down here that's going to, that's going to do our uh, work on our data, so to speak. Like I said, it's a very toy example. We're just multiplying something by two. It's completely trivial. Um, so now that we're doing some work here, the traditional code is just going to go sequentially through and multiply everything by two, and we're going to print out and confirm what our result is. Uh, it's just numbers 0 through 18, as expected. And on the other side, we make a call to uh, complete the uh, read ops and the, with the vector function. And we finish scheduling. And we make sure the work is completed, finish up, and we end up with the same result. It's a little bit more code. It's a little bit more verbose. It's not quite as clear, but it makes up for all of that with performance. And this isn't the sort of thing you do on tenants. It's the sort of thing you do with a really large set of file operations. Um, there's no way you'd ever try to set up a dispatcher if you just have tenants. It's kind of crazy. 
So what is it like to backport C++11? It's a little bit like trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. Um, maybe not quite that bad, but you're still forcing uh, two incompatible standards to work together. And my recommendation is really evaluate how much you need C++11 for whatever you're doing. If you can avoid the backport, it might be worthwhile. Uh, if you can't, we're going to cover that in a minute. So, all right, that printed out a little strange too. Uh, these are what I encountered. Um, these are not, you know, these are not tautology, tautologies. They're <coughs> definitely going to, your mileage is going to vary with uh, what I'm presenting. Um, we targeted uh, Clang, uh, GCC 4.6, Clang 3.1, and, and Visual Studio 2010 as our minimum architecture. And, you know, your mileage is going to vary. If you have to use an older uh, compiler like uh, 2008, a lot of what I'm, some of what I'm going to present probably isn't going to be applicable. Um, and you're probably going to have more problems. In the same way, if you go back uh, to an older GCC, you're going to run into different problems as well. So <laughs> basically, I don't think you should backport if you can avoid it at all. It's uh, not really what you want to do. And I am completely aware that I'm literally giving a talk about how to backport C11 right now. Um, but you only really need to do it when you have to. Uh, <laughs> if you can avoid it at all, you really should. Uh, I can't stress that enough that it is a ton of work. Yes? Uh, why did you do it? Because we had to. Why did you do it? Yeah. Uh, it was required. Oops. It was required. Uh, I think the. There was a large discussion about this on the Boost mailing list. It is certainly not written in the Boost guidelines. It's not anywhere on Boost.org. You're completely correct. But the discussion on the on the mailing list was that it, we needed to support at least the last three revisions of those compilers, and so we did. Well, <laughs> but you know, look, I mean, um, when Boost started, you know, a decade or more ago, there was not compilers. The idea is to push the language forward yeah. as far as possible. You want to be on the bleeding edge. That's exactly the point yeah. of Boost. And so I don't think that as a library author, you should be sort of back in the corner and says, you know, I'm not allowed It wasn't that bad. Play. It was a really good learning experience. So okay. I'm well, just going to look at it like. I got a lot out of it. Because we're in a session here where there's a discussion about, you know, what is the boost policy with respect to libraries and so forth. And I think that, you know, people shouldn't be thinking that, you know, maybe because you guys got into a list discussion where they said, well, we want you to do this, this, and this, that really has to be the case. And certainly the other thing I would say is that there's no such thing as a boost policy which stays the same necessarily. likely could have been any of those things. Uh, thank you for making the point. Uh, for the camera, the point was that's not in the boost guidelines, and that's very, uh, our situation isn't indicative of the state of boost. So if you're going to. So moving on, uh, what you should expect is your code is going to grow a crazy amount as soon as you start making it work on these old compilers. Um, AFIO HPP went from about 1,500 lines to uh, over 2,000. Uh, there, I have a caveat here that there was some extra stuff that went on, but 
I'd say 90% of it was all just making things work. Uh, so if your code base being large is something you need to avoid, I don't have a good recommendation for you. We, we could grow. <laughs> um, you're going to have a lot of compiler errors that are really hard to find. And fixing those errors are probably going to break a bunch of stuff. And you're probably not going to get a good performance. Um, we have some recent data contrary to that, apparently. Uh, but that's a very weird case where we refactored a bunch of the code, and I think one of the older compilers happens to optimize uh, some of our workarounds particularly well. Uh, you should also reflect uh, a lot of trouble if you need to re replace any missing STL components. Um, even if Boost has it sometimes, it's not, it just doesn't work out as great as you think. <laughs> so, and there's definitely a lot of difficulty if you use a large amount of medic programming, which AFIO certainly does. <sighs> so you should decide early what platforms you're going to support, and it's really going to guide your decisions on what you can do and, and how um, you should use C++11. Uh, if you know you're going to be working on Visual Studio 2008, probably avoiding it is a good idea. If you absolutely can't, I'm going to sort of attempt to help you out uh, with some of the problems we found. Uh, these are, major, uh, are fairly minor issues. Missing things like range for loops, uh, no enum class, uh, missing L SDL components like STD Atomic or Chrono. Um, these are fairly easy to fix. Uh, the range for loop has a simple fix from Boost. You're going to be in Boost. You can use the, this macro expansion. It does a really good job. It replaces with the C++11 uh, version when it can. Otherwise, it uh, intelligently uses the uh, older C++03 version. Uh, and for the novices out there, if you don't know what a num class is, it's a strongly uh, typed num, a scoped and strongly typed num. And it's got a nice little clean syntax in C++11. And this is what happens when you use when you try to work around it with Boost. Uh, there's a lot of extra stuff going on. Uh, some of these type defs are um, for other reasons. But basically, we're doing different things based on, on what's going on. If we don't have any enums, we're using Boost scoped enum. Otherwise, we're doing a regular C++11 uh, version. And then there's some extra code that is uh, making a bit field. Uh, it's really easy to fix if you have access to Boost. And if you can't for project constraints or uh, your company's policy, you're going to run into some trouble. It's uh, not necessarily easy to, to work around. Uh, uh, for the STL components, we got away with using Boost versions, and it worked fine. Um, there was a few issues with the uh, one of the compilers and getting it to figure out which version it should use. But other than that, it uh, worked out just fine. Uh, n this is the more interesting part of the talk. Um, specifically, variadic templates are probably the most interesting thing we did. Uh, it's pretty difficult to make those work without uh, any support from the, from the compiler. Um, it's not something you can really easily do with the libcall. I know that there's some. Um, creative programming ways to do it with like uh, nested tuples and, and stuff. Um, we opted to use a preprocessor. Um, it's something we had seen in Boost before, and it worked particularly well for us. We didn't have an uh, unbounded number of variadic expansions, so it worked out pretty well. Um, basically, we're going to use the uh, Bruce preprocessor library, and we're going to use the preprocessor to make a, to overload the function many, many times. Uh, in a systematic way. So we're using the preprocessor to generate more uh, source code for us automatically. And what's iter iterative, God, I can't talk. Iteratively create new template definitions on each pass through the loop and exp uh, add more and more uh, variables to the uh, parameter list. So by the end, we have a large number of overloaded uh, functions that all do the same thing. 
Uh, in a C++11 header, it's really short and concise. Uh, it's nice. It reads fairly easily despite all the metaprogramming that's going on. It's fairly clear what's, what's happening. Um, and as soon as we go to the other version, that changes quite a bit. Um, everything's done in this macro, and <laughs> it's, it's certainly less readable. I mean, you really have to kind of figure out what's going on, what is in, how does class A work. It's not straightforward. It's not clean like we, we'd want it to be. But if you, if you want you to use variadic templates, you have to do something. And it's, I don't think any of the solutions are going to look particularly nice. Um, and this is where our implementation becomes. It was a very small amount of code before, and now it's quite large and a bit unwieldy, and I don't think probably most of the people here have a really clear idea of like what's happening. Like, you, not saying you can't figure it out, but it's not obvious. Like, this isn't, it's not the same as it was before. It's certainly like, uh, it's, it's certainly clouding what, what's going on. Uh, we also ran into a problem on a couple of the compilers for limited support for lambdas, and you end up with uh, problems for return type, type deduction, and you end up with a lot more complicated metaprogramming. Um, we end up using std, std bind and std function. Uh, we didn't get a, on one of the compilers. We couldn't use uh, the boost versions. It just uh, wasn't and it wasn't compatible um, with what we were doing. And here's our original lambda. Really short and concise, and then it becomes this. And again, it's still pretty clear about what's happening, but it's certainly not as nice as the top line. And that eventually, it looks like that. Again, not so great. Uh, we keep well, the pound else is supposed to be on its own line, but uh, we keep seeing this uh, repetitive pattern where my code is growing and growing. And it's becoming less and less clear what's going on because I have to use the preprocessor constantly to decide which version I should be compiling for which compiler. And here's another example of the same thing. And it's even less clear because it's a long, more complicated function. And this was kind of a pain to get to fit on the slide, to be honest. Um, yes, sir? Um, or did you just choose to do it this what, way? What, like boost MSVC? Or did you choose to do it this way because you had to do it this way? Or was there some other reason? Uh, I think mostly we felt we had to do it this way, and it worked. Um, so there so could be a, there could be a, uh, some of it, yeah. yeah. Uh, there might be a more sophisticated way, but this is the solution I came up with. Yeah, okay. So, uh, it seemed to be, it seemed to be fairly consistent with, uh, what was in the rest of Boost. Uh, and then we ran into an, to an internal compiler error. And my first thoughts when that happened were that, oh no, I broke the compiler. I'm so fired. Uh, I, I'd never run into a compiler error. I, didn't, I thought I broke it. I thought I just ruined, <laughs> I thought I ruined our whole code base. And I had no idea what I'd done wrong. Because I kept looking at the, the changes I had made uh, in, the, in the repo, and I, it looked perfect. Um, I'm running a little long. So this is the error message. It wasn't particularly helpful. <laughs> uh, you see up there it says, I have a problem on line 350. I didn't have a line problem on line 350 or anywhere near, problem, uh, near line 350. And then it says there's some kind of problem in this Microsoft file. Uh, not great when you're trying to track it down. Uh, diagnosing this was not easy. I ended up just turning portions of code on and off. And it was really not obvious what was going on. In the end, I ended up moving a struct from inside of a function call that is the only function that uses it to outside of it. I've never convinced myself why that fixed the problem on this compiler, because it works on all the other ones. Um, I even tried to look through the disassembly and 
I couldn't satisfy myself about why it happened. Uh, there's some issues with coning lookups, and I'm going to have to run through this a little bit faster than I wanted to. Uh, and my highlighting's gone. Okay, uh, well, you'll see here on the bottom version, there's a lot of uh, namespacing going on. There's a lot of explicit uh, things. At the top, uh, we had a, uh, inside this function, uh, up above, there was a using namespace locally for this one function, and it worked great on all the other compilers. Uh, but we ended up having this problem here from some, either some problem with the uh, compiler's version of the STL or just it's, it's a name table or something. Just it couldn't find what it was looking for. And you kind of got to ask yourself after you do all this and you work for a long time, is it worth it? Um, <coughs> and that's going to always end up being a question for you, right? Is the effort worthwhile? Uh, for us, I think it was because we got we had satisfied what we thought was uh, necessary to enter peer review. Um, this is briefly about what the summer of code is. I think everybody here knows that Google funds students to work on open source projects for the summer. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. But I will say that mentors are important. Um, this was probably one of the best experiences I've had in my life. I was an engineer before this. I designed buildings. I worked on bridges. Uh, I had a few great mentors and professors and professionally, but this was far and away the best professional experience I'd ever had. I learned more in these six months, or in the three months of the last summer than I did in a whole year of classes. And I hope everyone here in this room and anybody outside will certainly take the opportunity to uh, find opportunities to mentor uh, students like myself and to do, uh, to do work with them and, and and their younger employees. It makes a huge difference in what an engineer can learn and do and what they're capable of. Uh, I'm going to open it for questions now. So does anybody have any more questions? My slides are available. Uh, if you want to contact me, that's my info. Uh, so thanks for coming. This was my first presentation, and I hope I wasn't too nervous. Uh, I blasted through about part a half of it real fast. So nobody has any more questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and enjoy dinner. <laughs>